Brian, thank you so much for being here. Um, the thank CEO of Coinbase. I think everybody wants you to explain a little bit about what this thing called Bitcoin is. So we'll get there. Um, but first, I wanted you to tell us about your journey because you started the company in 2012. Mm -hmm. You were an engineer at Airbnb. You'd started a few things before that. Yeah. Um, but what was it back then, before anybody knew what Bitcoin was, that made you think, this is an opportunity? Yeah. Well, let me just zoom out for a minute to put you in the mindset I was in at that time. So I had studied computer science and economics in school, and I had taken a, a year to live abroad in Argentina, which is a country that had gone through hyperinflation. And then, as you pointed out, I joined Airbnb, and they were a company that was moving money to 190 countries all over the world. Um, and so I sort of had a front row seat into the difficulty of integrating with the global financial system. Mm -hmm. Every country has kind of their own systems you have to integrate with, with different fees and delays. And so in December of 2010, I happened to read the Bitcoin white paper, which was written by this mysterious person who nobody knows, Satoshi Nakamoto. And it immediately- Is he a real person? I have no idea who he, she, or they are, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, it definitely captured my imagination when I read it because it talked about how the whole, the whole world could have this universal currency that ran on the internet. And I felt like it just kind of grabbed me. And I felt like this is the most important thing I've read in like five years. So, I started going around to different meetups in San Francisco. Like they had these very early Bitcoin meetups. And you might laugh at this, but I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm too late to the game because there was already like Bitcoin exchanges that were there. This was like the 2011 timeframe. And I'd go to these meetups and like the room was half kind of brilliant computer scientist people and half just completely crazy people. So kind of like online dating. Probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, in that environment, I kind of uh, started to tinker with a prototype on nights and weekends, which eventually would become Coinbase. And so um, that was a little bit of the origin story. You left Airbnb like pre-IPO, super hot yeah. for this thing called cryptocurrency. Yeah. What is cryptocurrency? <laughs> well, I'm serious. <laughs> Give us a little crypto 101, because there are a lot yeah. of people in this room who are intrigued by it, but don't know where to start. Right. Well, cryptocurrency is just digital money. So it's like money that you can send around the internet. And um, Bitcoin was this fundamentally a computer science breakthrough. So it solved this problem that had never been solved before, which is that if I'm going to send you a digital dollar, um, how do I prove to you that I didn't also send a copy of the same thing to somebody else? Because in the digital world, it's really easy to make copies of things like photos or any kind of digital content. And so the only way people had solved it to date was they have trusted intermediaries like banks that sit between us. And so they atomically debit and credit an account to make sure I didn't double spend it. And Bitcoin came up with this brilliant solution, uh, which was it allowed me to send you a dollar and prove that I didn't sp send it to anybody else, but we didn't have inter any uh, intermediaries in the middle taking a fee or slowing things down. And so it basically created this um, global version of cash um, or gold, if you want to call it that, um, that allowed anybody to transfer value to anybody else in the world uh, trustlessly over this global network. So it's basically supposed to be less hackable, less fraudulent, <laughs> less risky, but it almost seems to people who don't understand it that it's more of all of those things. Yeah, well, it's brand new. And so, I mean, just like cash that you have in your wallet, people can come take your wallet and steal your crypto money as well. Um, but it does have some nice properties that are even better than you know, traditional cash. So for instance, sending it over the internet allows me to send it instantly anywhere in the world. Uh, whereas you can't do that with uh, cash you know, in the physical world. So um, there's a number of advantages, but there's also, as you pointed out, a number of challenges to it becoming like a global currency. So you got into Y Combinator. Yeah. Um, you got backed by Union Square Ventures, Anderson Horowitz, a number of you know, other investors, Kevin Durant's an investor. Yeah. Um, and now you store $20 billion in digital assets. Yeah, it depends on the day. The prices have been changing a lot, but- We're gonna talk about that. 10, 10 to 20 billion-ish of uh, customer crypto. So I think we're the largest custodian of crypto out there right now that we know of. So basically in the beginning, you were just offering the opportunity to buy and sell Bitcoin. And today, talk to us about the range of what you do. Sure. Well, actually, the very first product was I just thought there should be a hosted Bitcoin wallet, kind of like my inspiration was something kind of like email with Gmail. You know, nobody wants to run their own email server. And if you lose your computer, you don't lose all your email. It's stored in the cloud. So I just made, you know, a hosted Bitcoin wallet, something similar to that. 
But a funny thing happened, all these people were signing up for the product and they were like, well, I like the product, but I don't have any Bitcoin to keep in the wallet, so it would be nice if I could buy some. And that was the next feature we launched was the easy way to buy and sell it, and that became the first product that got mainstream adoption. We've got about 25 million customers of that product now. So going on from that, we now have a number of products. Um, another one we launched is an exchange. So it's kind of like, you know, if, if Coinbase is like the Charles Schwab or Fidelity of crypto, um, our exchange is kind of like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ of crypto. So we did about 150 billion of um, crypto trading on that exchange in the last year. And now we have uh, other products coming out as well. We have a custodian for institutions. We have an asset management firm that creates these indexes, index funds or ETFs, kind of like you know, the S&P 500 of crypto. So you know, our mission as a company is to create an open financial system for the world. And one of the first things we need to do to make that happen is enable people all over the world to get their um, fiat money, that's what we call it, into and out of crypto money, and sort of be like that bridge all over the world for people to get money into crypto. Um, and then once we do that, we need to shift crypto into what I call the utility phase, meaning let's have people actually start to use it in their daily lives for various goods and services. And that's the next big challenge that we have, which we can talk about if you want as well. Well, so talk to us a little bit about the journey, because as you were building the company, I mean, the market just took off. I mean, how many cryptocurrencies are there today? Thousands. Thousands. Yeah. And how many do you host on the platform? So we only list um, five today because um, a lot of those things are brand new and higher risk. Um, some of them, frankly, are scams, right? And so what we've done is we've taken a very curated approach. Um, one of our goals is to build the product out there in the crypto space that's the most trusted, meaning it's secure and compliant um, and the easiest to use. So that means that we're not trying to list everything under the sun, mm -hmm. um, especially as new consumers are coming into this space and trying to understand what they should and shouldn't buy. It's kind of like um, not every company can get listed on the New York Stock Exchange. There are some minimum requirements before you can go public there. So what's it been like for you? I mean, has it really been like being on a rocket ship, whatever that's like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's organized chaos, right? Um, I, certainly for me as an entrepreneur, it's been a crazy journey. You know, we now have about 1,000 people at the company. It's about six years old. Um, every year, there's just like a, another thing to learn, a new skill set, you know, whether it's like fundraising or um, learning how to manage teams more effectively, or even now we have a number of offices around the world, six or seven, and so uh, just communication across a global workforce and all these things I'm, I'm definitely learning on the fly. So let's talk about the price. Um, Bitcoin peaked at 19,700 something dollars last December. Now it's below 6,000 today. Yeah. Every day, I feel like I'm reading a new story about Bitcoin hitting a new low. Yeah. Is this the new normal? Like, is this what the price of Bitcoin should be? Well, the way I think about it is that this, this uh, technology is going through a series of bubbles and corrections, right? So we've actually been through about four or five of them now where Bitcoin made this big run up in price and there was kind of irrational exuberance and then it corrected back, you know, 60, 70%. And each time it does that, it's at a new plateau and it's kind of matched the growth of the company, right? You know, if you go back to 2012, 13, when we started, we had maybe 5, or 500 people a day signing up. And then at the next, after the next bubble and correction, we had like 5,000 people a day signing up, you know, and now it's more like 50,000 a day signing up. So. Um, this technology, just like the internet, right? Remember that in 2001, the internet went through this crazy bubble where everybody's expectations were way ahead of the actual value, and it crashed down. Um, but a lot of good companies got started in the trough as well, which, you know, like companies like Facebook, which later turned out to be very big companies. So the same thing is happening. Like, people's expectations are all over the map, but I think the real world adoption and usage is like pretty steadily increasing each year. So if you want to, start dabbling in cryptocurrency. I mean, where do you start? I mean, buying, a, starting a wallet is, is one thing, but obviously there are so many different options and there are, as you mentioned, a lot of people out there trying to make a quick buck. Yeah, I mean, so certainly the easiest way to get started in crypto is just to own a little piece of it and you know, your friends can send it to you. Um, you can go online and like ask for people to send, send you crypto. The, there's so many crypto evangelists out there that they'll, they'll love it if you do that. Um, but once you own a little piece of the technology, it helps you to understand it. You can start to talk to people about it and then look for ways to use it in the future. So um, what do you think about the risk factor here? Obviously, the SEC has not been very positive on Bitcoin lately. They've rejected a number of these Bitcoin ETFs. There was a lot of optimism that regulators would get on board. Why does the SEC still not believe? Mm. 
I mean, from my point of view, actually, the SEC has been pretty positive on it. Um, they've, I don't expect them to kind of take some brand new technology and instantly bless it. You know, their job is to ensure that there's a safe market out there that consumers aren't going to get defrauded or anything. So I think rightfully so, they're looking at it with a lot of scrutiny, especially as there's so many new coins coming out there that are, you know, of questionable value. Um, so from my point of view, they've been very actually good to work with, um, just helping the ones that are more established come out. And the next big challenge we have working with them is uh, we need to jointly define a uh, standard for like what is an acceptable cryptocurrency, how would you classify one as a security versus a commodity, all those kind of questions. Warren Buffett has called it rat poison squared. Jamie <laughs> Diamond has called it a fraud. Um, are they wrong? Yes, they're wrong. I mean, <laughs> um, and you know, of course, Jamie Diamond came back and corrected himself after that. He recanted ish. Um, Look, I think, you know, if you go back six years, it was actually nine out of ten people who I talked to were crypto skeptics. Now it's getting harder and harder to find crypto skeptics. Mm -hmm. There probably are still some out there, but it's becoming contrarian to be a crypto skeptic instead of the other way around. So I think just like all new technologies, when they first come out, people are skeptical, and then they start to see real-world use cases, and they get a little bit more excited. So what is your perspective on ICOs? It seems like there's a new initial coin offering every day whereby funds are raised unregulated and you've got a few investors who say, I want to back this, but there's no regulation around it. Yeah. How do you see ICOs evolving? Yeah, so for, I mean, with my Coinbase hat on, um, our, our job is just to be the most trusted and easiest to use products out there in the market. And so we've taken uh, a more cautious approach to looking at ICOs. We haven't really participated in anything in that area yet. But with that being said, I do think ICOs are an important innovation in the world. And uh, the reason is that it's really difficult for people out there in the whole world to raise money for new ventures. Now, here in Silicon Valley, you know, entrepreneurs like myself are lucky enough to have a network of people and we've been able to raise capital. But if I didn't, you know, I, least I went to school in Houston, Texas, right? And um, I didn't know any angel investors there. The ones that were there, they were from oil and gas. And if you went in there and you pitched them a new software product like cryptocurrency, I think they might, they'd be very unlikely to invest. So there, and there's people all over the world with even less opportunity, right, in many foreign countries. So for them, ICO is the ability to raise money from people all over the world who might send a little bit of crypto into this address on your computer as part of a crowdfunding project is a huge breakthrough. And yes, there's a lot of legal questions to work through. Um, there's a questions about quality on some of them, but I expect the ICO trend to continue. In fact, like this year in 2018, I think it's on track already to be 4X, the size it was in 2017. And ICOs have broken all the previous crowdfunding records out there. So you've said Coinbase's objective is to be about trust and legitimacy, not these sort of fly-by-night exchanges. What is it that you're doing at Coinbase to make sure that you are the leader, the brand leader in cryptocurrency, and that you give you know, all of this, you know, you see a huge opportunity here, opportunity here a good name? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is that we work proactively with regulators, mm -hmm. right? So um, not only in the U.S., but we're operational in 33 countries. And so we've always tried to be an um, educational resource, proactively reach out to them, uh, whereas I think others in the industry have kind of tried to fly under the radar, right, which is a totally different approach. Um, you know, the second thing is around secu security, like cybersecurity, like storing this cryptocurrency is a really hard problem. And there's all these hackers out there in the world who are trying to break into exchanges and steal crypto. Um, and so we've built a, a track record and a reputation so far of being the most trusted at that, which is why we have the deposits that I mentioned earlier. And, you know, some of the things that we do, we talk about publicly, which is 99% um, of all those funds are stored entirely offline. They're not connected to the Internet. Um, we have a, a, a series of key holders that are geographically distributed around the world um, that need to come together in some kind of consensus to move any of those funds. And there's redundancy, so, you know, pieces of it can be lost or um, forgotten and that kind of thing. And, you know, if you just take me away, you can't, you can't actually get access to the funds. There's a, a group of people around the world that need to come con to consensus. So um, there's many things I could talk about. We have insurance on it and all these things. But I think compliance and cybersecurity have been two of the biggest pieces that have helped us get that more, most trusted reputation. Something else that you are trying to be a leader on, which I love, is on diversity. And we've all heard about the blockchain bros and how the Bitcoin and crypto industry is sort of at risk of rewriting all of the wrongs that the tech industry has in being so undiverse as yeah. it is. What are you, so first of all, why 
did you decide to do that? Yeah. And what sort of progress are you seeing internally? Yeah, um, so the reason why is that we're trying to build, um, we have an ambitious mission and we're trying to build the best products. And to do that, we need to get the best people into the company, right? And, you know, talent, you know this, talent is everywhere, but um, opportunity is not. And so um, that's part of why it's important for me to, to make a company that has this kind of inclusion. So some of the things we've been doing on that front, um, one of them is I created a top-level company objective, uh, which we review every month in front of the company, around diversity and inclusion. And so we have an OKR, they call it, you know, um, a key, uh, object Objectives and key results. <laughs> yes, uh, in the Valley lingo. So that's one thing. Um, another so you're setting targets for yourself? Yes, okay. for the company. Um, another thing that I've done is um, there's something called the Rooney Rule, which uh, is part of the sourcing process where you, you have, a, um, for us, we set a goal for ourselves of sourcing at least three people for all VP and above positions from underrepresented backgrounds. And the reason I did that was that um, I felt like bringing in leadership that was um, diverse would be a way to um, automatically attract talent under them to come into the organization. Um, so that was an important one. You know, the last thing that I, that I started doing that I'll just mention is uh, we, we worked really hard to eliminate or tr at least try to reduce the amount of bias in hiring processes because there, there's always going to be some. But one way we did that was we created, um, you know, we started interviewing people based off of not culture fit or whatever that ambiguously means, but... I prefer culture addition. Yeah, culture way. add. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we started interviewing people based off of our values and our skills, and we were working to create a standardized set of questions so that, you know, each candidate will get asked ideally the same set of questions, and there's a standard rubric of answers and things like that. So, you know... Working with people like Joel Emerson and those folks has been, and uh, Ellen Powell has been really helpful to bring in some of those, um, those ideas. Super important. All right, we're going to start taking questions in a moment. Are you seeing progress? Like, what are the results that you're seeing as a result of your efforts? Yeah, so we've seen some um, positive results. And uh, obviously, we have a long ways to go still as well. But, um, you know, one thing is that uh, actually a third of our leadership team is women now. Mm -hmm. So that's, I feel like, a good start. And actually, a third of the company um, is women, which is still not where we'd ideally be a 50-50, but you know, in fintech, that's um, above average. So we're we're happy about that. Um, you know, we did hire um, a head of diversity and inclusion, which is I think somewhat rare at our size company. We're starting early on that, and we've created some employee resource groups as well, uh, which are groups of employees who can come together. And I think that's contributed positively to a culture where um, people feel included. They can just do their best work. And, you know, we have this kind of rule, like, if somebody is brilliant and they're a jerk, like, it's an easy decision, they don't get hired at Coinbase. So I think that's been um, a good outcome so far. All right. No brilliant jerks. Um, but no stupid questions either. Anybody have a question for Brian? Go ahead. Yeah, so there's certainly company, or sorry, countries all over the world that are taking a different look at cryptocurrency. Um, my general view of it is that most places in the free world, um, they are adopting this technology. They might want to, you know, they rightfully want to protect consumers as it's being adopted and introducing thoughtful regulation is a piece of that. But they're certainly not anti-crypto. In fact, the opposite. There's many jurisdictions around the world that are um, seeking out crypto companies like Coinbase, uh, we're receiving pitches, you know, where can we build our next office around the world because they recognize that this technology is a way to stay on the forefront of both finance and tech. Um, now, there are going to be some countries in the world, just like the internet, uh, where, you know, it's restricted or it's filtered, and um, I think crypto is going to end up following a similar path uh, to the internet in that regard, you know, how China has the Great Firewall of China or uh, North Korea has a private internet, right? So I think there could be an, end up being countries like that, and the citizens there will actually use VPNs and things like that to try to bypass those restrictions to get access to cryptocurrency. Anyone else? Go ahead. Brian, um, I guess countries like uh, Argentina... Oh, sorry. 
There's been countries like Argentina or Venezuela where crypto just became the de facto you know, currency and have saved like the economy. Um, why do you think it's so hard for some other countries to just realize the usefulness of that? Right. So I think there are certainly countries going through economic crisis, and I, I think there's pockets of people in those areas that are uh, getting interested in cryptocurrency. I, I don't want to say that it saved those countries. That might be an exaggeration at this stage. But um, I think there is certainly interest amongst those people in having stable currency where they have the highest pain point, right? And it's really terrible to see what's happening in places like um, uh, Venezuela. So, you know, one effort that I've started on the side is a, is a nonprofit called GiveCrypto.org. And what we're doing is trying to make small payments out to people in the world who are going through economic crisis. Um, crypto seems is a very good way to get real time small amounts of payments to people directly in their hand so there's not an intermediary. And then helping them exchange it to local currency if they need to or uh, do crypto to crypto transactions to buy whatever they need, I think is a really important use case. So, um, I'm bullish on that in the next, say, three to five years. I think you will see countries going through economic crisis where everybody has a smartphone and the internet now. Um, they will, you, should, you could see people organically adopting crypto as an alternative. Go ahead. I feel like a lot of um, the crypto chat is always about kind of buying and selling. Can you give us a sense um, in America of real life, like I'm paying for bread, like wh what adoption rate is that? And is it in certain major cities or who's doing that? Because I don't feel like I see that a lot. Yeah. So you're absolutely right that um, the vast majority of usage today of crypto is in the investment phase, right? It's people buying and selling it, trading it, speculating. Um, and in the US, I would say that's probably 90% of activity, by the way, investment. Let's, let's call it roughly 10% of it to be uh, real world usage. And people are not using it necessarily in, um, you know, call it brick and mortar stores or like at Starbucks or something like that. They're using it more like online. So uh, the early use cases are things like online crowdfunding. Um, there's people who are creating a bunch of games. There's people creating new user generated content sites, kind of like, you know, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook equivalents, where instead of an upvote or a like button, you actually transmit a small amount of value. So people who are, creating content that's useful to others, they're actually earning money on this uh, universal currency of the internet. So those are the kinds of use cases, along with the emerging market things that I talked about, that I think will take off first. Um, and it's going to be people who have the highest pain point. And it, I think it'll be quite some time before you, know, you cross the street and go to Starbucks in the US and pay with crypto, just because that, you know, the, the financial system in the US works pretty well for most consumers. There's a higher pain point in other areas. One more. One more question. Um, oh, thank Sorry. you, thank you, Brian. Does Coinbase is it re is it required to report gains on portfolios of users in any of the countries right now? Um, so no, that's actually something we've been working with the IRS on. Is we'd like to just issue 1099 statements, just like any brokerage would, to all of our customers, and uh, hopefully we'll have a solution with them shortly about the exact format that they will accept of that. Um, so that's what we're working on it with them. We'll do one more right here. Hey, how you doing? So uh, are there any cryptocurrency uh, either new or, or, or already out there that really excites you as far as the usage? It doesn't have to be a specific one, but just, you know, what excites you about the usage of uh, a particular coin? Yeah, so, um, you know, I never want to give uh, investment advice. I always have to be careful here. Uh, just from a regulatory point of view. But there are a number of new tokens that we've announced that we're exploring at Coinbase. Um, you can go read, read about those on our blog. Uh, we mentioned a couple of them there. So I'll, I'll restrict my comments to that just because I don't want to get in any trouble. Very careful. OK, I have a last question. Um, what is next for crypto? And then let's separate crypto and blockchain. Yeah. Um, because they're two very different things um, with different Potentials, and some people say they don't see the potential in crypto, but they see the potential for the blockchain. Mm -hmm. What do you see? Okay, so I mean, first of all, more of like a one-on-one -on -one answer. <laughs> so, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, cryptocurrency is like digital money, so people transfer it around to transfer value. Um, blockchain is kind of a broader concept than that, and it's it's the technology underpinning cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. But you know, it can be also used for other things like private blockchains, uh, like a consortium of banks might come together uh, as an alternative to SWIFT, which is like a global you know, settlement network between banks. 
Um, people are using blockchain for other kind of more, you know, theoretical things right now, like governance or identity. But my, my rough assessment of it is that um, cryptocurrencies, meaning like the public blockchains, are where we're going to see a lot of the innovation, or more of the innovation. Um, just like when the internet came out, there was like public internet, which is where most of the innovation happened, and then there was private in internets or intranets, and some companies use those and whatnot, but most of the innovation was in the public internet. Mm -hmm. So I think the same thing will happen with crypto. So is blockchain going to change the internet as we know it? Or is the internet simply going to evolve? It is going to change the internet. I mean, the internet, uh, when it was created, there was a couple original sins, if you will. Like if you talk to Mark Andreessen, who created the first web browser, um, what he says is that they, they made a few mistakes. So one was they didn't build privacy into the internet as a base level thing. Um, the other one was they didn't make payments native to the internet. And now, years later, this got invented. So the internet, which is inherently global and decentralized and no country or company owns it, um, now has a currency that is also global, decentralized, and no country or company owns it. That's hugely powerful. Because previously, the internet was mostly about transferring information. Now you can do information and value. All right. Well, luckily, there's no pop quiz. But hopefully, we all learned something. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian. Thank um, you. We'll keep watching. Okay. Thank you.